can't wash this out. Forgot. All right, that worked. It yeah. was a little rushed. Yeah, I mean, but it keeps. I think I remember like previous years, I'm always like, oh, I can get through plenty of these in a the time, and it yeah. ends up coming right in sometimes. Yeah, they might be so real. Um, well, how did you do that? Um, I took a roll with a exacto knife. Wow. <laughs> yeah. All right, heading up to class. I don't have my keys. My keys. It'll be difficult. Yes. <laughs> Blonde hair, blue eyes, such a magic. Did you know that they used to kill people like you back in the day? Here? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes, right here? Yeah, it says on the door that we're still upstairs. Why would you look at that? I don't know how much is on here. Oh, you like it? Yeah. <laughs> Frank, you got spray? Where are you going? Is this where a lab assignment? Yeah, I do it. Uh, I'm gonna look at that. Okay. Okay. I think we're having a birthday party. <laughs> Celebrating the birth of science. Now, <laughs> <sighs> oh, you guys can open up the 
Notes on today's day on classroom. Based on classroom. Are there any characteristics? No, um, the new notes on ionic compounds. I think I posted last night. All right, let's see who's here. Chris, Dan, Felipe, Jaden, um, Nice hoodie. Uh, uh, Vincent, Tristan. Bill. Christine. Um, Christian Dean, not here. Julian, Jack, Tim, Danny, Hanako, and Brody. Sorry, already here. Who's just coming in? Brody? Who else came in besides Brody? All right, I'll tell you who I'm marking absent. You can tell me if you're here. Christian Dean, I'm marking absent. And John. John? John? Absent? Um, Jaden Sieri? I'm here. Okay. Bryce? Oh, I see you. Here. And Nico? Miku's always the first one here. There I'm here. You. Okay, gotcha. All right, I got everybody. So, uh, well, I don't have John and Christian Dean. Okay, sign into the chat, guys. Please. And open up the notes from classroom on ionic compounds. Is my chat not in the um, chat with my name? I might have did it too early. Um, I don't know. Hold on. Yeah, you're in there. You're the first one in there. All right. Share screen. Oh, it, it should be on classroom. Not on classroom. Uh. Yeah. It's on the weekly plan. Then can you guys go to the weekly plan? What do I need? It would be faster if you go to classroom, scroll down a couple days to the weekly plan and click on today's date. So oh. Yeah. Actually, I got to erase last period. Uh, clear all. How do I? Apple pencil. How do I clear all? Isn't there a way to clear all? A notability. Thought there was. Eh. I'll just erase while you guys are finding the handout. Okay. All right. Oops. Okay. 
do, do, do. All right, everybody have it open? Yeah. Very good. All right. All right, so hopefully everybody at this point has turned in their lab and turned in their quiz on the periodic table, families of periodic table. Um, so we're going to continue with that, the idea um, of looking at electron configuration or, or noble gas configuration for shorthand. Um, continue talking about valence electrons and core electrons and go into bonding. There's three types of bonding. We're going to focus on ionic bonding first. So the, of the three types of bonding, ionic is when <clears throat> you have um, the donation and the accepting of electrons. So if we think about the noble gas configuration for, let me go to a periodic table first, actually. start there. Think about the noble gas configuration of an alkali versus a halogen. So I'm using these words now, these are now normal vocabulary. Everybody know where the alkalis are? Huh? Alkalis? Yeah. <laughs> there. <laughs> group one. Group one are the alkalis. I'm going to talk about them a lot. I'm going to talk about the extremes a lot and the halogens. I'm going to write their noble gas configuration. So I'm going to pick sodium. Its noble gas configuration is neon 3s1. And chlorine is a halogen. Its configuration is neon 3s2, 3p5. Okay, so what happens here is that sodium is unstable because it doesn't have a noble gas configuration. It doesn't fulfill the octet rule. It has one extra electron. So what does it want to do to become stable? It wants to lose that electron. And on the other side, we have chlorine. What's chlorine want to do to become stable? What does it need to do to have a full octet? Eight in the S's and P's. It's 3s2, 3p5. 2 plus 5 is 7. It needs one more. So that's what happens, is going to happen. And then we wind up with um, an ionic bond. When the, the metal gives away its electron that it doesn't want, and the nonmetal takes the electron that it wants, and both become stable. It's the perfect exchange of electrons. So when sodium loses that electron, what is its charge? It lost a negative particle. Plus or minus? It lost a negative. Positive. Positive, because it lost a negative. And so when chlorine gains an electron and becomes Na3S23P6, full S and p orbitals, two plus six is eight, then what is chlorine's charge? It gained a negative particle, negative, negative one. Okay, so negative or negative one, positive or positive one. You can take or leave the one. If it's a positive, we assume it's positive one. If it winds up being a positive two, we have to write the two. All right, so now we know opposites attract and we form sodium chloride. That is table salt, right? That is an ionic bond. I will get this into the notes if you didn't have a chance to write all that down when I post the notes. All right, so with ionic, we're donating and accepting electrons. With covalent, that we'll do the next chapter, we're sharing electrons. 
it's like a tug of war for the electron, but they're both kind of equal strength. One might be a little bit stronger, but they're sharing the electrons. And in metallic, we'll talk about that. I think you'll watch a video tonight about metallic bonds. Um, that's just um, like the, um, you remember when we were talking about the lab, about what conductivity is? What is conductivity in metals? The flow of, of electrons. So when we turn on the switch, the wire, copper wire, electrons flow, and that's conductivity. Metals are the ones that are conductive because they allow the flow of electrons because they don't really want their electrons. They just let them flow freely. Whereas ionic, the, the non-metal wants the electrons and with covalent, they're all non-metals. They want the electrons. Metals don't really want them. So they flow and they're conductive. So right now though, we'll focus on ionic compounds. Um, this picture has an image of, of the electrons being transferred. So we have the metal here and the non-metal over here. And we see that that electron leaves the metal and goes to the non-metal. So now we have eight electrons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight in the outer shell stable. And that non-metal just does not want to give up that electron. He keeps it. But that's fine because the metal doesn't want the electron back. Now this metal only has two electrons, doesn't have eight, but helium is a noble gas that's also very stable. So having two electrons is fine. It's still stable like the noble gases, like helium. All right. Electronegativity, so that's a new term that I'm gonna be using. That's the attraction or the desire that an atom has for an electron. So let's go back and think which group, the alkalis or the halogens are going to have the higher attraction for the electron. Which one wants the electron? Alkali or halogen? Which one in that on in the writing down below took the electron? Which one took it? Which one lost it? Which one took it? Chlorine took it. Chlorine was P, three P five, and then when it took sodium's electron, because sodium didn't want the electron, it became three P six full octet. So. If the definition of electronegativity is the attraction an atom has for an electron, which group wants the electron has the higher electronegativity? Which one has a higher attraction? Alkalis or halogens? Halogens. The halogens. We don't have to write the full noble gas configuration to figure that out. We can just look at the periodic table and say, okay, fluorine is right next to neon. If it has nine electrons now and it goes over one and has 10, it will have the same configuration as neon. We can see chlorine is right next to argon. Bromine is right next to krypton. We can just look at the periodic table and see that those guys are the ones that want one and then they'll will have the same number of electrons as that noble gas. If you look at your periodic table, you see that the charges are at the top. There's a negative one there because halogens will always gain one electron. When we get into the transition, there's no ch charges written on the transitions because that's variable. We can't predict that. They're irregular, but we can predict that alkali or halogens are going to lose one every time when they bond. We look at the alkalis, the charge over the alkalis is covered, is a plus one because they will always lose an electron to become stable. Low electronegativity over here. That's a long word. I usually just write E-N, but not until you know it. Hey, over here on this side, high electronegativity. So like, how do you remember that word? You know, it's a, it's a long word, but think about the roots to it. So electron is in there. So it has to do with electrons and negativity means it becomes negative, which means it's gained an electron. That's why it's electron negative because it's attracted to the electrons. 
Um, where am I going? Hello. All right. So halogens have a high electronegativity. That means they have a high attraction. Oh, it's right there. Um, why? Because they want to gain an electron. They have an attraction because getting that electron would help them fill the octet. Why do alkalis have a low electronegativity? Because they want to lose an electron. They don't have a high attraction for something they don't want. You know, your mom said you want some, some mushrooms? No, why would I want mushrooms? You have a low attraction for mushrooms. F2. Have to lose an electron to become stable. Becoming stable means filling S and P orbital. <clears throat> filling the S and P will give us that full eight electrons, the octet. Kind of all works together. <clears throat> Let's watch an example of an ionic bond forming. The guys at home will probably be able to see it better than the guys here, but <clears throat> we'll have to make do. You can click it on your screen, probably, right? Sodium metal is heated until it melts and just begins to burn. Okay, so what he has here is um, on the right side, he has a little ladle and he has a chunk of sodium metal. So remember the video where I cut, I cut the sodium metal? Mm -hmm. So sodium metal is it's a metal, it's in group one, it's a silver, shiny, react, very reactive metal. But to get it to react, you do have to add some heat. So he's putting that in under the flame and heating it up. And then he's going to put it into the chlorine gas. So chlorine in its natural state on the periodic table is a yellowish green poisonous gas. Okay, heats it up and then puts it in. Then it is immersed into the yellow green chlorine gas. Oh, this is okay. The sodium so begins to, to react chlorine with an intense and yellow flame. It's exothermic, which means it gives off a lot of energy. Anytime something it becomes stable, it gives off energy. Chloride. We are observing the exothermic reaction of sodium metal with chlorine gas, producing the white solid sodium chloride. Right, and so it gets salt after. So we take that silver metal and put it in only white solid sodium gas, chloride. and now we have something we can eat. Okay, because it's after it's purified, <laughs> after we get all the poison out of it, we can eat it. So remember, when a chemical reaction forms, the product can be completely different than the reactive. If it's a physical change and you add salt to water, dissolving is a physical change, then they're similar. Salt and water taste like salt water, but so sodium and chloride gas is a chemical reaction, so it's an extremely different substance. To the point where we can eat it. All right, ionic compounds are also called Salt. Oh, there we go. A little picture there. So salt is something I'll say a lot because it's shorter than ionic compounds. It's one syllable. It consists of metals with the opposite, which are non-metals. Oops, not numb. So it doesn't have to be alkalizing halogens. 
All right, if we look at the periodic table again, we can look at um, alkaline earth metals. Where are the alkaline earth metals? Just to the right of the alkali, so group two. So what do the alkaline earth want to do to become stable? Not lose one, but lose two. lose two. They're going to lose two, right. And so if they lose two, who would be the perfect group to pair up with? A group of nonmetals that needs to gain two. So oxygen's group needs to gain two, and then they would be stable. So magnesium oxide is a salt also. Strontium um, sulfide is a salt. So any metal with a non-metal is a salt. It's not, not always going to be a one-to-one -one ratio. And we'll learn about that on Monday. But they're all salts. They're all ionic compounds, all salts. All right, metals, blank electrons. Non-metals, blank electrons. Metals donate electrons. And so non-metals accept electrons. Perfect exchange. Both become stable, both fulfill the octet rule, which is eight in S and P orbitals. You guys wanna watch the dogs teaching chemistry? Yes. <laughs> dogs teaching chemistry. So the class is students or is it class of dogs? It's just two dogs. They're just two dogs. <laughs> yeah. They're just Welcome cute. to Dogs Teaching Chemistry. Our first lesson, yeah. chemical like bonding. Baby. Chemical bonds are what bring yeah. atoms together. A chemical bond is an attraction between atoms that allows the formation of a chemical A whole series of these dogs teaching chemistry. The electrons that participate in a chemical bond right, so. are called valence electrons. There's the valence electrons. Atoms outermost shell. Let's take a look at the types of chemical bonds that can be formed oh, between atoms. Where'd it go? So dog number one takes picks up the valence electron. He's An got it. Bond is formed. And dog number two takes the valence electron. electron to the other atom. This results in a Now they have a charge. The one that took it ion, and a has negative a negative charge. charge. Ion. And these are what we're going to call them, a cation and an anion. So we'll kind of wish there was a cat involved attract. here. And the result is an ionic Because so it would help you remember that the word is cation, not cation. Covalent chemical bonds. They're sharing. So we, we're not doing sharing of electrons in this chapter. So that'll be covalent. We can watch that later. There is also what is called polar covalent bonds. These are covalent. All right. Cute dogs. All right, metals lose electrons and become positive ions called metals lose and become positive ions called cations. Remember the cat. Cat. I don't know if I can draw a cat. It's a kitty cat. So the cation, that occasion. <clears throat> it's not really a cat, huh? Non metals gain electrons and become anions. There's your anion. It says, just take it, please. Don't mind if I do. So these are things that you need to study so that when I'm speaking, I'm not speaking a foreign language. So that you understand what a cation is. When I say it, it's the positive one. The anion is the negative one. <clears throat> Salts do not exist as molecules, but in an extended Crystal lattice. Uh, can you read that? I C E. Anybody know the word lattice? Lattice is a regular word. Let me show you some examples of some lattice. Lattice work. Apple pie. Is this apple pie? I actually had last Thanksgiving, I took a picture of it because it says it has a lovely lattice crust. So that is a lattice. See that pattern? That's a lattice. Under your deck, you might have a lattice. 
you might have some vines growing up on a separate lattice somewhere in your yard. And I love the Rubik's Cube because it's really a good example. When you do the alternating um, colors in a Rubik's Cube, it's a great example of a crystal lattice. Mm -hmm. You have the positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, alternating. So when we write NaCl, that's a one-to-one -one ratio. It's never, ever in the world in nature going to be just one sodium and one chloride. You're going to have quadrillions of sodiums and chlorides. But they're not just going to be random. They're going to be very organized, just like that Rubik's Cube that has the alternating positives and negatives. All right, so number seven, we can say, well, so um, number six, it says not a molecule. So when we get the covalent compounds, you might have a molecule like H2O. Those are all non-metal. There's no metal, non-metal there. So this is covalent, not ionic. So we never see one NaCl. We see a whole bunch of them. That's how they exist. They don't exist as one Na and one Cl. But if we had H2O, or this is just two atoms, maybe carbon monoxide, that just exists as two atoms floating around individually. Not a Rubik's Cube, COCO. All right, number seven, high electronegativity difference. That's key. Can't talk and spell that at the same time. Electronegativity. So that's key because that's the attraction for an atom. So one of them has to have a high attraction and one of them has to have a low attraction. So that's a big difference. That's the electronegativity difference. All right, so what do we think about the bonds? Are they weak or strong? Is that process reversible or is it hard to reverse? Do they want to stay that way or they, you think that non-metal wants to give back the electron? No, it wants to keep it. It wants to keep it. We don't bury nuclear waste in salt mines for no reason. Those bonds are strong, super strong. Anybody ever see um, Dirty Job salt mines? That's a good. That's a good one. We don't have time to watch any clip salt mines right now. Maybe another day. So they have very strong bonds because that that nonmetal that anion doesn't want to give the electron back, and the metal doesn't want it back. So it's perfect. So therefore, they have high melting and boiling points. Whoa. All right. So we're gonna talk about melting, boiling, and dissolving the, the three differences. What is the difference between those? So if you melt a salt, here we have the example of two ionic compounds and their melting point is 521 or 759 degrees Celsius. That's even higher in Fahrenheit. Okay, and you see we have covalent bonds, they're usually gas. Those are going to be gas at room temperature. All salts are solid at room temperature. Okay. You think about the metals, you think metals are solid? Not all metals are solid. Some have fairly low melting points. Mercury is already um, liquid at room temperature, but all salts, all ionic compounds are solid at room temperature, very high melting and boiling points because they have very strong bonds. Number 10, when enough force is applied, they are brittle. So why are they brittle? Okay, so if you look at the Rubik's Cube, think about the Rubik's Cube that has the alternating positives and negatives. If we turned the top layer twice, then it, the two blues align, the two greens align, and the blues align. What happens when you have like charges? What happens when you have opposite charges? Opposites attract. 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 Opposites attract and like charges repel. So that when we apply enough pressure to shift these layers, we wind up with two negatives next to each other two positives next to each other, more negatives next to each other, and then we have repulsion. And so that's what makes them brittle. Not malleable, right? It's very different than a metal. So this is why they're brittle. All 
All right, good conductors, because I gotta do this demo before we leave. Um, number 11, not conductors of electricity in the solid state. All right, I'm going to move down to the conductance line. Conductance is the flow of blank or blank. So what do we say with metal? It's the flow of what? Electric. Electrons. It's the flow of electrons in metals. So if you take an ion, if you, if you think about the ionic compound, that nonmetal takes that electron. It doesn't let it go. It doesn't let it flow. So there's no flowing of electrons, period, in any salt. But if we dissolve it, we wind up with ions. That's conductive also. So an ion is a charged particle, like the Na plus, Cl minus. <coughs> and then we have conductance. So if we, conductors of electricity in the liquid state, so liquid means there's no water involved. We just heat it up until those ions break away from the crystal lattice and they're moving around. But when you dissolve them, water is involved, obviously, but water comes in and teams up on those ions. They're strong bonds. So we need a team of water to pull those ions away. And then the ions are free to move. CL is still not giving back that electron, but it's a CL that's floating around in water. So they dissolve. Anybody know what the word is? If we say it, they dissolve. Salts are how soluble. Soluble. Salts are soluble, meaning they dissolve the water. Some dissolve a little bit better than others, but overall, most salts dissolve. We might have one extreme exception, but I can't think of one. I can think of times when it takes more water to dissolve some salts than other, others, but in general, they all dissolve. All right, I am going to show you the demo first, and then we'll watch the video of the hydration process. I just wanna make sure I get the, the demo in. So I gotta stop sharing my screen. All right, so what we have here, I'm gonna reverse it so you're not staring at my face. I'm gonna unplug. What we have here is rinse water. What we have here is salt water. This is pure water. And this is sugar water. Let me see where it is. Sugar, they're all labeled. Oh, this is not gonna read. <laughs> Dang it. Hold on. No, I just need it back here. Sugar okay. and water. All right. So, if conductance is the flow of electrons or ions in um, regular water is not an ionic compound, we don't complete the circuit. There's no flow of electrons, so the light doesn't light. If we have sugar water, Sugar is carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, all non-metals, not an ionic compound. We would need, we need a metal with a non-metal to make an ionic compound. Sugar does not come apart. It stays as a molecule altogether. It, it dissolves, but it doesn't come apart into ions. Now we have salt water. When salt water dissolves, the water pulls apart the crystal lattice into individual ions. So you see how that light, I just, I didn't even put that much salt in that water. So any salt that would happen with, but it won't happen with sugar water. It definitely happens with salt water. So here's proof that you, you don't wanna take 
what is it, your hair dryer says, don't use your hair dryer in the bathtub because there might be some ions in there, that water that conducts electricity to electrocute yourself. All right, so there's an example of an ionic compound when it's dissolved, conducting electricity. Let's watch the video of hydration to show you what's actually happening on a molecular level. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna share my screen. And then we'll be done. Tomorrow we're playing bingo. Make sure everybody has their bingo card made. Bingo. Because there is a point to playing bingo. You need to get used to the periodic table and where the elements are located for what we do the next day, Monday. Um, we don't have school Monday. Tuesday. Yay, no school Monday. Martin Luther King Day. I don't know why this won't expand. All right, this is French, so I'll narrate. That is a water molecule. Water has hydrogen and oxygen. The hydrogens are positive, positively charged. The oxygen side of water is negative. So there's a positive side and a negative side. They're gonna show that, I thought, here. There's the negative. The positive, you can barely see on our screen, but I can see it on this screen. Guys at home can probably see it pretty well. Then we have the sodium chloride, the sodium ion plus and the negative chloride. And there's your crystal lattice. Everything's moving a little bit, it's jiggling, nothing stands still. But if they have such strong bonds, how is it possible that they dissolve? Well, it's because it takes a team of water molecules. They gang up on the ions and together they can pull them apart into solution. Now we have the positive and the negative ions surrounded by water, but they're still ions. Therefore, there's conductance of electricity. So when you get a whole bunch of them going at the same time, you dissolve all the salt. Is there a point where you put too much salt in the water, it stop, stops dissolving? Yeah, you put too much salt, it stops dissolving because we need a lot of water to get those ions pulled apart. So we need a lot more water than salt or the dissolving process will stop. All right. And here's some images. That is a water molecule. So we say salts aren't molecules, but covalent substances are. Water is covalent. It has a positive side and a negative side. And so the negative side of the water can attract the, the negative side of the water attracts the positive cation. So Na is positive. This is the negative side. This is the positive side of water where hydrogen is. And so see how they align? I'll show you a demo where I can move water without touching it by using an electric charge because water has one side that's positive and one side that's negative. So if you're looking at salt water, this is what's actually going on. The positive hydrogen side is attracted to the negative chloride ion. Okay, I'm actually done. Those are just more pictures. We'll do that later. Time we got, oh nine, we're good. All right, so homework tonight is a, um, video on metals and a couple of Google form questions. So just submit that through Google forms. If it's not on classroom, I'll put it on there right now. All right, see y'all later. I'll put these notes online too. I'm so sure. Still on here. Okay, I'm starting. And there we go.